Hi, welcome to Blogging Heads TV. This is Culturally Determined, and I'm your host, Arya Cohen-Wade, and today my guest is Mark Joseph Stern. Uh, Mark, can you introduce yourself? Hi, I am Mark Joseph Stern. I cover uh, LGBTQ issues and legal affairs for Slate Magazine. Great, and um, you've been on Blogging Heads a couple times before, and uh, the reason I wanted to have you on was you wrote a uh, really interesting article, a uh, short article called, uh, I'm Ready to Declare a Truce in the Gay Cake Wars. Now, the Gay Cake Wars is not a new series on Bravo. Uh, <laughs> can you explain what the Gay Cake Wars are and why you decided to declare a truce? Certainly. So <clears throat> the Gay Cake Wars are my term for these odd legal battles that have been going on in states like Colorado uh, and Washington, which have LGBT non-discrimination ordinances, um, which say businesses can't discriminate against uh, gay customers. And what's happened is we've seen these bakers who are very devoutly Christian, who really don't like gay people, um, refuse to bake wedding cakes for gay couples who come into their store because they mm -hmm. don't want to partake in the wedding ceremony between two people of the same sex. They claim it violates their religious principles. Um, and so right. essentially their Christianity forces them to discriminate against gay couples. Uh, so that was the one side of the gay cake wars for a while. And now there's a new twist, which is getting a lot of play. Uh, and what happened was this guy uh, went into a cake shop in Colorado and asked the baker who was gay friendly to bake him a cake that had a depiction of two gay men holding hands with an X over it um, <laughs> right. and the text God hates gays. Right. Um, You'd have to, this guy has to have a lot of, you know, I guess chutzpah would be the nice way to put it, to, you know, walk into a store and actually a ask for this. But so I assume, do you think, it's, do you think this is basically just a stunt or, uh, or, yes. or what? I assume that this is a test case because um, what happened was when the baker refused, uh, he filed a discrimination claim uh, saying that he was discriminated against for being a Christian, that the baker, mm -hmm. by not baking that cake for him, he was, his Christianity was discriminated against. That, that sounds like some test case. Maybe he came up with it himself. I call him a cake war vigilante. Um, <laughs> maybe he was hired by one of these uh, far right anti gay legal funds to, to set off this lawsuit. Um, mm -hmm. But either way, it doesn't really matter. The point is the claim is on the table. So now we've got two sides of the cake wars, the pro gay side, the anti gay side, and they're all facing off over wedding cakes. Right. And we actually so um viewers may remember that I moderated a debate between you and uh, Matthew Schmitz on Blogging Heads about six months ago, and we'll link to that. And we started off with this question about wedding vendors. And um, I mean, there's also the florist and the wedding photographer, these, you know, and like a caterer, you know, there's all these possible wedding vendors you could have. Right. But I think they're all actually, they all have kind of weirdly di different issues. Um, I think the florist seems the most like the florist could not have a legitimate <laughs> objection to, to any, anything. Like That's a, right. A floral arrangement all well, is is like kind of artistic like you know it's it's the same as like the caterer or something uh but i think actually we, we talked about the photographer and the photographer i think it, in our previous discussion you did say that you thought the photographer did have kind of a first amendment claim of you know you can't force someone to take a photo that they don't agree with or something along those lines That's but then right. the ba so the baker is with a big because a cake has decorations on it that could be words or images, the baker falls somewhere in between. That's exactly right. The photographer issue is the hardest. I still very much struggle with it. Um, I, I had lunch with two uh, law professors recently and we talked about it and they, like me, are just totally vexed by this issue because there are first amendment principles at play. But the baker is a lot easier. Um, <clears throat> and so what I what I tried to do in this article, uh, I encourage everybody to read it and you know sign up for my crusade for this truce, um, <laughs> is to split the baby, so to speak, and to say, look, you are correct, people out there who are on this one side of the gay cake wars, that cakes can convey an expressive message. Cakes mm -hmm. can do this by having words or images on them, right? So I say, look, let's make a compromise. Let's do this. Let's say that no baker in any country and in, 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 in any state throughout the country can be forced to put text or pictures on a cake. 
that she or he does not want to put on the cake. So a baker right. doesn't have to write, God hates gays on a cake. A baker doesn't have to write, congratulations on your gay marriage on a cake, right? <laughs> right. So the baker is covered on both sides. But uh -huh. let's also say that bakers are not permitted to refuse service to any customer based on any classification based on sexual orientation, based on gender, based on religion, uh, mm -hmm. based on race, any of those things. So let's compromise on both sides. Uh, and I think it's a very reasonable compromise. But as I wrote in the piece, I really doubt that people like Matthew Schmitz uh, are going to accept this compromise because they were never just talking about the text that was that was pasted on the cake. They were uh -huh. talking about letting bakers refuse to even sell a cake to gay couples because uh -huh. they thought that even selling a gay couple a wedding cake or a cake at all could violate their religious beliefs. Right. So I, yeah, I think what you, what you offer is, is a pretty fair bargain and I don't know if the other side would take it, but yeah, I think, you know, this issue has been revealed to be a lot more complicated than it seems on the surface. And certainly the fact that it involves cake, which is kind of like a sil <laughs> a silly thing makes it seem silly, but like, you know, can, like, so there's all these kind of associate issues that you could pull out um, in, in a kind of an absurd way. So like, let's say like the American Nazi party wanted to have, you know, a, a celebration of Hitler's birthday, um, you know, and they wanted to have a cake that had like Hitler's face on it. So like, it seems that seems absurd, but like you, you know, and they, so they went to a baker and said, we want the Hitler cake. And the baker said, no, like, could they sue the baker? Like, that seems absurd. That, that couldn't happen. And then, you know, what if you had a cake that just, just said something like, I don't like Muslims or something. <laughs> what a great know? cake. That's a right. Right. Cake. And that, so that, you know, it also seems weird to force someone to write, I don't like Muslims you know, on a cake. And then you can kind of think like, so we're kind of thinking about the baker kind of like maybe like a, like a printer. Like, let's say you, you, for a rally, like you wanted to print like a big poster or something that had, uh, you know, a statement on it that would be offensive to, to someone or other, um, you know, could they refuse? So what do you know what the, in that case, like, is there, cause then it's, it's content, not identity. So like, there's the difference. That's right. And that's that's very interesting. I don't know of any cases out there, although there must be one, of some printer at Kinko's who refused to print, for instance, a pro-choice banner for a rally because right. it violated her beliefs. Uh, I don't know of those cases. But... Or, or an image of a aborted fetus or something. I mean, you could you could run it either way. Yes. You know, and, and someone was, would just say, I don't want to I don't want to print this. But then that, that seems like the kind of a, a business decision and you're not discriminating against someone for for their identity, you know, in that case, but then what if it's like, uh, you know, a African American History Month parade or something like that, and then, you know, so it, it is pretty complicated once you kind of think about all the possible permutations. Oh yeah, once you've opened Pandora's box, it is a total mess. Um, <laughs> and I would, and, and left to my own devices, my own personal beliefs, I would not open that box. I would say, when you open a business to the public, you're opening it to all of the public, and it's not your, mm -hmm. it's not your, job to micromanage the messages that people are asking you to create. If you if you decide that you really want to be a baker, then you have to take into account in that decision, I might have to sell a cake to gay people that says congratulations on your wedding, even though I hate gay people. And if you decide right. to work at Kinko's, you might have to remember, you know, maybe working at Kinko's will force me to print uh, pamphlets that I really disagree with. In, in, mm -hmm. in my perfect world, these are private businesses that are open to the public, and I don't see them having any really strong free exercise or free speech claims, but I understand that there are others who do, and so that's mm -hmm. why this is a compromise. I am willing right. to open that box if it must be opened, um, and go ahead and, and let all of the all of the test cases out um, in order to just set the ground rule that blatant discrimination based on identity is not going to be permitted. Okay, so this made me think of another, you know, hypothetical that maybe is kind of absurd, but I think, you know, could possibly happen. So kind of the classic, you know, public accommodation law that, you know, the Civil Rights Act um, was aimed at was kind of like hotels that refused to um, serve African Americans. And so, you know, any hotel that you open has to, you know, you can't refer refuse um, someone who asks for a room if, if they have the money to pay for it, no matter who they are. But what if it's like a hotel that, um, like, like, Okay, so let's say there's like a white supremacist convention. And so maybe it's at the hotel or maybe it's somewhere else. So like, it seems like the hotel would be fine saying white supremacists you know, or, or white nationalists. So let's say it's more like identity, like just people who are really proud of being white. Um, you know, like we refuse to let you hold your 
you know, your seminar at our, in our conference room. Like that seems acceptable, right? Uh, yes, I think so. I think it would be acceptable under most laws today. Right. But then like you couldn't say white supremacists were not letting you get a room at our hotel, right? That's right. That's right. Um, probably. It depends on what the non-discrimination law in that state covers. I don't, I'm mm -hmm. fairly confident that federal non-discrimination laws don't cover your political beliefs, um, but a lot of, uh, at least some states do, including uh, my fine uh, jurisdiction of Washington, D.C., I believe. Um, mm -hmm. And so in Washington, D.C., if I have this right, um, discrimination based on political beliefs and white supremacy is a political belief, right? Mm -hmm. Um, that would be not permissible in Washington, D.C. Uh, there are probably mm -hmm. a lot of states where it's totally okay. And so it all depends on what classification you fall into. Um, I, I think that in most states that would be that would be perfectly fine for the hotel to kick out a bunch of white supremacists and say you're not holding your seminar here. But honestly, personally, thinking this out, I think if you don't, if you're not willing to face the risk of housing people whose views you disagree with, maybe you shouldn't open a hotel. That's just <laughs> right. going to happen. <laughs> right. Yeah. I, so, okay. Yeah. So, but I did, there does seem to be a weird line between host, hosting the, the white supremacist convention and then, well, let's say the white supremacist convention is being held like in a public park and then everyone stays at the Radisson that's near the public park. And so there's 50 white supremacists who signed up to stay at this Radisson. So that would get a lot of bad press for the Radisson. And then maybe the Radisson says, you know, we're not letting any white supremacists stay here. So that does seem like that would be illegal. Yes, um, yes. But it's something that could conceivably happen. And of course, there's the famous case of, um, you know, the Nazis who wanted to march in, in Skokie. And that was decided in, in favor of the Nazis. Though I was recently reading about that case. And they didn't actually have the, that's right. the rally in, in Skokie. They had it, I think, in, in Chicago. Um, but the, the Nazis did have the rally. And so, you know, the, the offensive group, you know, will have access to the public park or something, but I don't know. It's, um, uh, I, I, thankfully there aren't that, you know, a ton of white supremacists who are holding conventions across the country. So maybe this won't come up, come up, but you could kind of imagine, you know, a, um, you know, a gay rights march or something is happening somewhere. And then, you know, a bunch of, um, people who are attending the march want to stay at a hotel and the people who own the hotel don't approve of that. So, you know, a kind of less absurd version of this could, could play out or maybe has played out already. Right. Although then they would be, uh, entirely at the mercy of whatever state they're in because many state laws protect gay people, uh, in public accommodations. And so if, if a Marriott tried to kick out uh, a bunch of people who were marching in a gay pride parade, um, in a state like Colorado, um, mm -hmm. the, the gay pride parade people could, could turn around and sue them and say, look, you're clearly refusing us housing in this hotel based on our sexual identity, based on our sexual mm -hmm. orientation. That is a protected class. Um, okay. But, but there's no federal law. I mean, there's a federal law protecting, um, discrimination against race, but there's no federal law. Is this correct? Protect against discrimination on sexual orientation that's correct okay but there are there are state laws and you know one of the absurd extra kind of absurd things about this is that the case in New Mexico um, is this the florist case I can't New Mexico remember. was the wedding photographer okay so that one actually um, you know New Mexico at the time didn't have gay marriage so <laughs> it wasn't it was like a commitment ceremony or something or you know a civil union ceremony or something and then the the photographer was saying that you know she didn't believe in this but you know, it wasn't, you know, marriage is the thing that most people who object to gay, you know, gay union object to marriage and they kind of have made their peace with possibly civil unions, uh, at least a, a number of them have. But, um, you know, if, if, if two gay, if a gay couple was throwing a birthday party and they wanted to hire a photographer, you know, it seems like you know, the photographer should before, you know, should have to. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I take a very cynical view of what you just said. I think that, uh, this notion that people who oppose gay marriage only do so because they want to protect marriage, not because they dislike gay people. I think that's mm -hmm. totally bunk. Um, the exact same people who are arguing against gay marriage today were the ones who are arguing against legalizing gay, uh, sodomy, um, 10 years ago, and right. they've always been anti-gay. They're just finding new outlets for it. Um, mm -hmm. And so I think that you've pointed out a very interesting and telling quirk in that New Mexico case, because everybody who is supporting the photographer on religious freedom grounds, not on free speech grounds, uh, was mm -hmm. saying, look, she just opposes gay marriage. She doesn't think that marriage should be between two people of the same sex. But like you said, this wasn't a legal marriage. This was just two women declaring their commitment to each other and their love mm -hmm. for each other. And so by if you oppose that, then what you really oppose are 
gay unions and gay people being in love. Uh, and right. so I think it, it reveals the animus that's sort of at the base of those claims. Right. Yeah, I think that's a good point. And, you know, in our previous discussion, and I think a discussion you had with Connor Friesdorf on Belonging Heads, which we'll link to, we, you know, animus was a was a key yes. word um, in, you know, how people think about people who are opposed to gay rights, you know, think about gay people. Um, I, I saw that you tweeted um, this uh, very interesting piece that was in the Washington Post um, within the past couple of days about a, um, a lesbian couple in Oklahoma who are preparing for their wedding. And I would, I would definitely recommend that piece. Um, it's just kind of you know, a great na narrative nonfiction um, kind of following, you know, this couple as they prepare for their for their wedding after um, marriage was gay marriage was legalized in Oklahoma by a court ruling in the last couple of months. And um, it's just really well done. And, you know, kind of I think it gives, you know, kind of both both sides, um, you know, kind of their fair shake in um, and, you know, portrays them uh, pretty, pretty accurately and sympathetically, even though, you know, the people who refuse to come to their employees or friends or family members wedding you know, kind of come off looking like jerks but you know they i think are given a, as sympathetic a portrayal as as is possible yes i agree it single-handedly justifies the existence of the washington post style section uh, <laughs> among, among other things um yes but no you're right the author does a really good job of making these people who when you hear about them in the abstract sort of sound like monsters you know they won't go to their friend's wedding because they oppose mm -hmm. gay marriage they're very good friends wedding it humanizes them and it shows what they struggle with and uh yeah. it actually made me feel more sympathetic toward gay marriage opponents than i have in a long time it made me feel sort of pity toward them because mm -hmm. they hold Old, they they want to they want to love their friends they want to support their friends um, and yet at the same time they hold this animus for, for some of these people actual bigotry in their hearts toward these people uh -huh. um, so I, I I agree everyone should go read that piece right now before they say another word about gay marriage <laughs> yeah so we'll we'll link to that that piece uh, that piece in the links below uh, uh, before we move on is there anything else you'd like to say about the cake wars or uh, or gay marriage or anything along those lines just that I encourage everyone watching to join me in my truce to see whether <laughs> to see whether the the right wing is really honest about what it opposes whether it opposes gay people entering the legal union of marriage or whether it just really doesn't like gay people okay yeah i mean and you know the court case is is going to happen in the next uh next couple of months Presumably. So this, uh, yeah so this uh, issue is, is still live uh and uh in dispute uh but maybe the truce will take hold uh you know stranger things have happened okay so i uh let's move on to a kind of a more uh, lighthearted topic although talking about cake is kind of inherently silly <laughs> um so there was a piece that uh ran in slate that uh, got a lot of attention, and it was by Ruth Graham, and it was, the title is uh, Chandler Bing is the Worst Thing About Watching Friends in 2015. So Friends came on Netflix uh, within the last month or two, and uh, and lots of people are rewatching it. I'm rewatching it with my wife. I think it holds up surprisingly well for a sitcom that's 20 years old. But she, uh, Ruth Graham, argued that uh, she, she, so she came in saying that uh, rewatching it, she thought Joey was going to be the character that she I didn't like because Joey is kind of like a uh, ladies' man, and he's stupid and a womanizer. Uh, but she was surprised that Chandler was the character who really rubbed her the wrong way. And I had a lot of problems with this article. First of all, because I think Ross is really the character <laughs> that is awful uh, on second viewing. I think Chandler is still kind of okay. Uh, but what did you know? Have you have you did you watch Friends when you were you know in, in the '90s? Uh, have you rewatched it now? And what do you think? Yes, I watched. I watched a lot of Friends growing up, especially the latter seasons. Uh, I enjoyed it back then. I didn't love it. Um, I've caught occasional reruns on on actual cable. Am I dating myself here? Like watching TBS, I've seen reruns, but I haven't I haven't checked it out on on Netflix. Um, I know okay, well I would recommend it. So okay. I think you're probably a couple years younger than me. So I watched it when it first came on in ninety five ninety six. I think is what the season it premiered, and I was uh, you know twelve or thirteen in those years. Um, and it was kind of a big you know it was that and Seinfeld were the two TV shows that I kind of most identified with as a young teenager. And I actually um, you know this case against against uh, Chandler maybe affected me strongly because when I was a kid, I really strongly identified with both Ross and Chandler wow. because I was like a hopeless romantic and like Ross. And I was also a, a smart ass like Chandler. So the, so those two characters kind of, I thought represented, you know, my 12, 13 year old self on screen and, you know, seeing them 20 years later, uh, you know, is in a different light, but I kind of disagreed with the case that Ruth Graham was making. Um, and I don't know. I mean, I think the, you know, there's, it's complicated because are we, you know, there's multiple le levels of, of any work of art, even a sitcom. So, you know, Chandler is like, you know, he's friends with the our friends, Ross, Rachel, and all, all the gang. Um, but he's obviously kind of 
uh, he's a sitcom character, and all these characters are basically cartoons. They're you know they're not humans. If we encountered anyone who acted like the friends in real life, we we would like run away because <laughs> you know any any sitcom character basically acts like a cartoon, right. uh, especially if the sitcom is on long enough. Um, but I, I so she was and one of the things that I the reason I wanted to discuss this this with you was. Um, one of the things that Ruth Graham held against Chandler was he seemed like the most um, homophobic of the characters and is obsessed with not appearing gay. And I wondered, and she linked to a, a clip that someone meticulously put together that's uh, extremely long, almost an hour, um, that is, uh, says, I think it's called homophobic friends or something like that. Yeah. So it's basically every, like, every joke that involves gay people on Friends um, you know, over like the, you know, possibly all 10 seasons, you know, assembled in uh, back to back. And I kind of, I just didn't really, I don't know. I didn't really get it. So what, so you watch at least some of that. So what do you think of this charge that Friends is, you know, 20 years later comes off looking really bad in terms of how it presents gay people? Yes, I suffered through at least 20 minutes of that horrible thing <laughs> just for you. Um, okay. So, yeah. <laughs> um, no, I, I, I kind of disagree with you and I agree with Ruth. Um, I feel like the show's treatment of gay issues is incredibly clumsy in retrospect. Okay. It's so clumsy. And, okay, and well, we should just we should just note that from the very first episode, um, Ross, uh, Ross's wife um, separates and divorces him because she realizes she is a lesbian. And so, the, so they're kind of like the chief, Ross's uh, ex-wife and her eventual wife um, are kind of the chief uh supporting characters who aren't in the main cast and i think you know so we remember this is 20 years 20 years ago i th i think really the portrayal is is pretty sympathetic and there are some jokes that maybe wouldn't be on a sitcom today but certainly you know the fact that there's two lesbians in the show they're not the butt of you know the traditional kind of jokes that a crass sitcom would make about lesbians uh they're presented very sympathetically they're raising you know there's three people involved in raising this child and that's pretty much shown as normal and a gay wedding is presented in the second season of Friends. I looked it up, but it's not actually the first gay wedding that was on television. It's maybe like the fourth or so. Um, and a, a weird fun fact is that the wo the woman who uh, played the officiant at at the the wedding um, is uh, Do you know who this woman is? Do you remember this at all? No, I don't remember. Uh, Newt Gingrich's sister. <gasps> oh, yeah, Candace yes. Candace Gingrich. Mm -hmm. I know. Oh, I think it's actually I know someone who knows her. Yeah. Right. I think it's actually Gingrich's half sister, right. um, who you know became a semi-prominent figure because she was an out lesbian, and you know Gingrich was the speaker of the house at the time. So it was kind of a you know political statement of casting, you know, this person who was is not an actress, just a you know a regular person and an activist uh, to to be the officiant on a, on a gay wedding in 1996. I think that's a pretty you know for 1996 where gay marriage was not legal anywhere in the United States or possibly anywhere in the world. I think that was kind of a, a pretty big statement. Yeah, I mean, I, I think you're right that the show was not homophobic and that there's sort of a, there's a tension in the creators and writers clear desire to depict some kind of gay issues and LGBTQ issues more broadly, um, mm -hmm. and perhaps to seem edgy, perhaps to seem cool, to seem sort of with it. Um, but also it's desire to still pitch to the lowest common denominator because it was, mm -hmm. I mean, it was an NBC Thursday night sitcom, uh, right. if, I, if I recall correctly. Um, yeah. Yeah. And it so was, you get, was, uh, I, I yeah, agree. 8, 8 PM, 8 PM on Thursdays. Yes. Yeah, that's right. Um, and so I agree that the portrayal of Ross's ex-wife um, is somewhat sympathetic. Uh, she's not presented as just being like some ridiculously butch lesbian or, or any of those stereotypes. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, the entire storyline is that, that storyline in particular is played up simply for how awkward it makes everybody feel all the time. Um, mm -hmm. th those characters are never allowed to be actual human beings, which I understand none of the characters are human beings, they're all cartoons, but mm -hmm. the, the, those characters, the two lesbians, only serve a purpose to make sort of funny situations where everyone feels awkward because there are these two lesbians and the guy that one of them used to be married to. Mm -hmm. um, and so that to me, that's not homophobic. Okay, I don't think that any of the writers who, who wrote those scripts were homophobic. But like I said, it's clumsy and it's kind of goofy and it's not at all sensitive to, to actual issues, generally to actual issues that gay people face. And so there's a tension. Mm -hmm. On the one hand, yes, it's progressive. It's showing gay weddings. It's showing a lesbian wedding with Newt Gingrich's half-sister. But on the other hand, 
it's, in, it's a, the entire storyline is really only there because it's funny how Ross is so intensely awkward around his lesbian ex-wife. Um, okay. And so if you compare that to a show like Modern Family, which um, had, you know, the great benefit of, of premiering in, in 2009, I think, um, it f comes across as feeling very out of date. Um, but at the same time, this was 1996. This was a, a, an, an eon ago in gay progress years. Mm -hmm. And so I, I sort of, I understand the case to be made against Ruth's article in this one regard that no, this wasn't homophobia. The characters weren't homophobic. They just weren't as with it as we would expect them to be in a sitcom today. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So that's interesting. Okay. So what that makes me think is, you know, there's kind of this critique of the way African-Americans are often portrayed in Hollywood, where they're not given their own storylines, inner lives. They're just there to serve the plot points of the white characters. Uh, so that's, you know, that's like kind of the magical Negro critique. Um, you know, the, it's just, it, you know, the, the journey of the white person is what matters. And this is, there's a piece recently, I, I can't remember what the, what it was, but it, it talked about, um, oh, it's talking about Selma and it talked about, um, uh, to Kill a Mockingbird, mm -hmm. and how, you know, the black characters in that are really just props, and it's, you know, Atticus, and, um, and, uh, oh god, I'm forgetting the name of the little girl, um, you know, it, you know, it's all, just to show what great people, you know, the, the Atticus Finch and the, the white characters are, yeah, and, you know, and no, those, like, the noble, uh, white person rescuing the, the black people, so I yeah. think that, that is an interesting critique that I hadn't thought of before, um, but I don't know. Okay, so I have another question that's related to this. So in this this clip that we'll we'll link to, that's 50 minutes of jokes that they're not really gay jokes. Um, some of them are just jokes that involve gay characters. Um, you know, she, uh, it also in addition to homophobic, it said heteronormative, and it said you know jokes that were hetero heteronormative in um, in Friends. And so I think that like that is kind of true because mostly the jokes are not that gay. You know, being gay is bad or um, or that gay people are bad. It's more like the male characters are afraid that someone will think they're gay. Um, or uh, the joke is that the male characters are doing something that uh, gay men would do. So there's there's one plot line that they, they excerpted, <laughs> excerpted the clip from this where um, it's one of the first, I think it's the second season, so Ross is dating Rachel. And uh, it's, it's so funny to be recounting these plot lines. So Ross is dating Rachel, or, or dating someone, and um, and he, and she uh, wants Ross to talk dirty to her, and so uh, Ross doesn't know how. So Joey, the ladies' man, you know, teaches uh, Ross how to talk dirty, and uh, Joey says, you know, talk dirty to me. You know, let's let's do some play, role, some role acting, uh, or some play acting. And so they start doing it, and you know, Ross is saying dirty things to Joey, and it's absurd because they're like eating sandwiches while they're doing this. And then Chandler, you know, unbeknownst to them, Chandler is coming out of the bedroom. And sitting there and watching them and smirking while they're saying these, you know, things that, you know, talking dirty to each other. And then Chandler cracks a joke and everyone laughs. So is that a joke that's offensive, that's heteronormative? Is that a joke that's homophobic? Or is that just a joke about, like, how straight men actually do act around each other? And the fact that straight men are, many straight men are actually afraid of seeming gay to their other straight friends. Well, I think that the answer to that would depend on what the reaction shot on Ross and Joey would be. Not to get not to get too hypercritical and uh, analyze the cracks of friends facade. <laughs> um, uh -huh. But I mean, that sounds like it could be a setup for a very funny joke, or it could be a setup for a gay panic joke, um, which is what, right. what I thought watching that series of unbearable clips was, it, these are mostly variations on a theme of gay panic. Straight okay, male so why why don't you define, yeah, so define gay panic. There, there are a lot of different definitions. One could be straight male characters afraid of being perceived as gay, um, afraid of gay people as sort of, you know, fiercely sexual competitors or, or predators. Um, mm -hmm. And so I, most of the Friends jokes fell into the former category, just panic about being perceived as being a gay man. And so in this setup that you just described so beautifully, um, I, I think... <laughs> we'll, we'll link to the specific clip so you can see, you know, these great uh, com comedic actors. Oh yeah, now I, I need to see it. So I think, <laughs> you know, if Ross and Joey then look utterly aghast and distraught and they think, oh my God, he just, you know, caught us looking gay, then that's kind of a gay panic joke. But if they mm -hmm. look like they're in on the joke, like, isn't it funny that we were, you know, sounding like we were gay lovers briefly, then that's a right. very modern, totally, you know, okay joke. And not right. to be, I think not it, I mean, I think it's, so I think it honestly fell somewhere in between those, but you know, is a gay panic joke offensive? Like, 
it seems like this is an actual thing that exists in reality is that straight men are afraid of seeming gay yeah and that's, so that's not I, that's not a good thing but it's something that's real so portraying it in a funny way you know is that is that bad that's what i couldn't tell from those clips is who the audience was supposed to be laughing at because there are so many scenes of like chandler and ross and joey hugging and then they'll like take a step back and say oh right. should we hug like that and right then and there's actually i just want to bring up one other plot plot line from a recent ep from an episode in the second or third season that is uh, related to this so um, so Joey is an actor and he's trying out for a role where he's playing a gay character. And so during the audition, he has, he kisses, he kisses another man and the director says, you know, you did a good job, but that, but your kiss was really unconvincing. So then the whole episode or one of the plot lines, of the whole episode is Joey is trying to kiss either Ross or Chandler so that he can practice so that he'll do a, a good job in the audition. So this is not, it's not treated like this is super disgusting. Like, can we believe like a man would kiss another man? Ew, gross. It's more like, it's just kind of silly that Joey is like, you know, every chance he gets like, oh, you, you're looking kind of sad. And then he like, you know, reaches out to them and they're like, I, you know, I don't want to kiss you. So it's not, you know, it's not like, ew, gay, gay people are gross. It's more like, and if they don't, they're not making fun of the fact that Joey would, is, is auditioning for a, a gay, you know, playing a, a gay character in this movie or whatever. It's more like, you know, jo Joey is just so stupid and like, you know, he's clumsy attempts to like kiss, you know, kiss a guy. And then, you know, the, the kind of the punchline, you know, they, in the, like the little final bit that rolls over the end credits is Ross like walks up to him and he says, okay, Joey, fine. And they kiss on the lips, you know, for two seconds or something. And, you know, the crowd goes like, ooh, or whatever. And then and then Joey says, oh, thank you, Ross. But they just called me this morning. I didn't get the part. <laughs> so, I mean, so, so that's, you know, that's just like a funny a funny punchline that, you know, I think could work. <laughs> it, 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 does, it does not seem to me offensive. Like, so how does that play to you? I mean, that sounds like that one lands because, again, you have to ask who the joke is on. And it sounds right. like the joke is on Joey for being so goofy and just being desperate to, to kiss another man. Right. And the other two men in his life not being particularly interested in it. Yeah. Um, so, you know, again, I'm, I'm now in the position of playing joke police. I promise this is not <laughs> something that I generally like to do. Humor yeah. is odd and in very personal. Okay. But so so to me, the question is always who who is being laughed at here. So that mm -hmm. who is being laughed at the character because he's being you know he's being goofy. Um, for those scenes that I was describing, those repeated scenes of two characters hugging and then stepping back and being like, oh, I'm not sure if we should hug like that. It's unclear mm -hmm. to me if the joke is on those characters for being insecure in their masculinity, or if the joke is that wouldn't it be funny if if these two men did something gay. Um, right. I think it's, I think, I think it is kind of both, but like, I, I, I think it is a legitimate thing to, to joke about because like I said, it is a legitimate thing that still was happening in the mid nineties and still happens is that, you know, uh, I mean, sometimes it can lead to, to violence in that case, it longer becomes funny. And I think, but I think it actually is something that kind of uh, prevents a certain sense of intimacy among male friends is that, you know, they, not friends, not the friends on TV, friends in real life is that they, um, you know, they don't want to come off as seeming gay. Um, so maybe they they act more reserved or they try to act more macho or something like that. So making jokes about that, I think, is, is a legitimate thing to do because it kind of exposes, you know, the fact that this is a, an actual cultural phenomenon. That's right. And if that was their target, that's a great punchline and something that definitely needs to be mocked and something mm -hmm. that is underexplored, I think, in today's comedies and in today's cultures. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe I'm totally wrong and Ruth is totally wrong and friends, like, pave the way for all the great pro-gay humor that we see mm -hmm. on the airwaves today. Um, you've made a very compelling case. <laughs> I just I just still think that the humor feels of its time and underlying all of it, even the most seemingly progressive plot points, you have this question of, is part of the humor coming from the fact that gay stuff is icky? And it's never right. fully resolved for me. Yeah, I, I think that, I, I agree with you that, you know, gay equals icky is kind of a, a subtext of at least some of the jokes. I just want to mention one other thing from sitcom history. So. Um, Cheers is also on Netflix, and I was rewatching that a couple years ago. We stopped halfway through because kind of the episodes are a lot of them are really just the same thing over and over again. But there's a plot line in one of the early episodes. This is probably around '82 or so, where for some I can't remember how, but the you know the the, the gang at the bar, so you know like Norm and uh, Cliff, right. um, they they hear that there are some gay men in the bar, and they like so the whole episode is they're trying to find out who are these gay men. I can't remember how they hear it. Um, if, if someone, I, I can't remember what the plot is exactly, but the whole episode is they're doing like a witch hunt, basically saying like, who, like, who are the gay men? And then they start kind of accusing each other of being gay. And so there's more explicit kind of like jokes about limp wrists and cross-dressing kind of like the more offensive, like 
Three's Company kind of <laughs> yeah. back gay people. Um, but then kind of the there's like a weird progressive twist to the episode because at the very end it's revealed that the two gay guys were just these two quiet guys who were sitting in the corner and of course, you know, look normal. And then they they do some kind of joke. They say something that shows that Norm and Cliff and so on are just idiots and they kind of walk out and they're shown to be you know, the people who uh, we should sympathize with, not with, you know, the, the regular gang who made fools of themselves. Yeah. So that was, I mean, so that was only 10, 12 years before Friends came on the air. That kind of, you know, that kind of humor about gay people. So I, th- I think Friends, I think it's got a bad rap, at least in, in, in Ruth Graham's article, in terms of how it's, you know, how it was treating gay people and, uh, and making jokes, which, which involve gay people to some extent. And, some you know, as I, as I suggested earlier, we, we cannot fairly judge it by the standards of a, of a wonderfully progressive show like Modern Family or, or got transparent. Um, mm-hmm. these, these shows that are so with it and so plugged into the gay community and gay culture and gay life. You know, we can't expect friends to, to, to be that way. It was this was the Doma. These were the Doma years, right? These mm-hmm. were Don't Ask, Don't Tell years. This was still very edgy material. So we can't expect them to handle it as felicitously as a show like Modern Family does. Right. Actually, you know, there's something that we didn't uh, discuss in our pregame talk, but we're going to discuss, but I have seen you write about um, that I wanted to ask you. You know, so there are, so there's commercials that have come on the air in the past couple of years that show um, gay families or show uh, interracial families at all uh, as well. And uh, there was a Cheerios one. And, you know, these kind of get into the news because the company makes the commercial and then some stupid person tweets about it, and this is just a random, you know, not like a media figure, a random, you know, idiot out there somewhere in America tweets something like, "Oh my God, this disgusting commercial that you know they showed an interracial couple and their, you know, interracial child eating Cheerios," <laughs> and then everyone rallies to to Cheerios' side, and so th- this is kind of played out in a couple different times and you know i think it's so it's obviously a good thing that interracial couples are being shown in the media and commercials are kind of the i don't know you know the the most commercialized obviously you know aspect of the media so you know the fact that um you know uh, 15 years ago gay people were not in commercials and if there were uh you know a mixed race couple you would very rarely see that in commercial but um and so you've written approvably of 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 some of these i think one that had kind of a remix of uh, norman rockwell Thanksgiving print, but I feel just kind of like cynical about this. And um, it seems to me that these, like, okay, it is kind of striking a blow for equality to have a commercial that features a lesbian family. At the same time, they're still selling whatever crap they're selling. And we, should we be, you know, should we be happy? Should we be celebrating if Cheerios, you know, which maybe maybe original Cheerios are, are good for children still, but, you know, Cheerios sells Honey Nut Cheerios and all the, all the other crap that's loaded with sugar. Like, should we be, like, should progressives feel like they should be celebrating these commercials when it's really just selling the same old shit in a different way. Yeah, I mean, I, I may change my tune if we see like a cigarette ad that has a gay, <laughs> that has a gay couple in it. But I, I, a few points on this. So number one, uh, if you need more reason to be cynical, all, all of these commercials that feature gay couples, different for interracial straight couples, but all of these commercials that feature gay couples turn out to actually be these sort of specialized ads that are part of some kind of usually internet campaign and never actually air on TV, at least in America. And so, Okay, so, that's, so that reinforces my theory that this is just a way to drum up online support. That's they right. They won't actually face the backlash of if they air it on the Super Bowl or something, then you know some people are going to send an angry letter to their local news station or whatever. That's exactly right. I write about it on my gay blog, and then all my gay readers read about it, and everybody goes, "Now I love General Mills because they produce this gay <laughs> ad." And but what right. they don't really think about, maybe they do and don't care, is that they did this to bait us to bait, you know, the gay community without having to risk the ire of a bunch of homophobic straight people. Now, I have to say, mm-hmm. in fairness, this this is even more cynicism for you, perhaps. Coca-Cola, in their Super Bowl ad about diverse families, I think last year, uh, yes, I remember this. had a gay couple for about two seconds, but I think, <laughs> I think they had children. And, you know, all of the families were only shown for a few seconds, but that made an impact, and that was very brave, and that's the exception to this rule. Um, right, but, but course, is there any? Is but is there any company? You. Yeah, that's more evil than Coca Cola. Yeah, I know. Uh, that's, know? Coke is is horrible. They do horrible, horrible <laughs> things to your body and to the environment. Um, yeah, and there's a new book out that I think is. T- 
about Coca Cola in India. I only read a review of it, but it's like you know, Coca Cola has like seriously hurt you know many third world countries. Oh you know? yes, yes, absolutely. They only and we've written about this issue. We're getting a little sidetracked, but we've written about this issue of corporations that are very pro equality, pro progressive, whatever in the United States, and then mm -hmm. go to a country where that's not smiled upon, and they totally change their tune. So a lot of companies do this in Russia. You know, in America they're all pro gay. They go to Russia and they decide, hey, this is not such a big issue to us. Maybe we won't yeah. get benefits to gay partners and that kind yeah. of thing. Yeah, so I mean, it's it's whatever whatever makes a buck, you know, no yeah. matter what the country. For most of the, most of these corporations, if if it suddenly turns out that you know being friendly to gay people, you know, sells uh, you know Honey Nut Cheerios. Yes, you're in correct. America, they'll do it. Uh, but maybe in Russia, uh, uh, you know, it, it takes something else. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure they have Vladimir Putin, you know, uh, chugging on a Coca-Cola or something, <laughs> oh, something dear like God. that in Russia. Yeah. Well, no, okay. So, um, yeah. So, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, you won't find argument from me on your general thesis. I think I like to see all of these ads taken together because they point toward a trend of just a greater acceptance toward equality as a whole in society. Mm -hmm. But individually, you're totally right. It's silly and it's it's very crass and and like you said, clearly commercial and it's just a profit-making opportunity. In, yeah. in the individual cases. As a whole, maybe it's something more. Every individual case, it's all about profit. Okay, yeah, okay, that's a good point. So we should be optimistic. The fact that the fact that um, cynical money-grubbing corporations, you know, see this as a way to make money is a positive signal, social signal, for where, you know, where things are going in the country. But, you know, celebrating the fact that, you know, Coca-Cola is doing something just to sell more cans of sugar water <laughs> is maybe not not the best thing. Yeah. Okay, so let's move from um, cynicism to you know uh, 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 embracing your haters. Um, so you you wrote a piece a, co a couple months ago with uh, uh, Katie Waldman. I guess it was more like a dialogue where you're talking about um, online comments and reader mail that you get. And um, so I recently started. You know, I've been behind the scenes at Blogging Heads for a long time. I'm behind. I'm in front of the camera now. And, you know, I, so I see comments and people are saying uh, things about like, oh, this was stupid, this thing you said, and why didn't you do this? Um, so it's, it's interesting to, um, you know, see that from the other side. So what do you, like, can you talk, so you obviously write about things that provoke a lot of ire among a subset of Americans. Um, how do you deal with uh, angry comments and hate, and, uh, hate mail and also maybe mail and comments that aren't, uh, uh, hate mail, but our you know criticism and and uh, do you, how do you think about oh, about that? Well, I'd love to hear your strategy after I finish talking. But <laughs> um, I mean, I have been in this game now for a, a while. Um, I've been writing for Slate for about two and a half years, and I, I hate to say this, but I'm sort of used to it. I'm sort of used to getting these incredibly angry and just all, all inexplicably mad um, uh, uh, comments and uh, emails and tweets and people just seem so furious with me uh, and so <laughs> they hate me so much and they've never even met me and I want to tell them like you know you, it's totally fine for you to hate me but maybe you should like hang out with me before you decide you hate me this much but but they uh -huh. don't care they only need to read like 600 words by me and they've decided they hate me um, mm -hmm. more so than so, that. Yeah, so what does that feel like that you know a stranger a stranger out there somewhere in America like hates you strong enough to send you an angry expletive filled email you know like, i have does, to how does, say how does that, make you feel? that doesn't bother me very much because i you know i think i said in that piece when 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 you get a lot of haters you know you're doing something right sort of mm -hmm. you know it's a, i write for slate slate is argument-based journalism and it's okay to be provocative it's okay to be out there and to make a really cutting edge argument and maybe to fail sometimes um but when you make a very strong take no prisoners argument you're bound to draw on haters and that's just the way the game goes so mm -hmm. it's okay that I get people saying that whatever I, I'm you know I pretend to be victimized I'm totally illogical that I'm in <laughs> that I'm an idiot now mm -hmm. I'll tell you though there's a different kind of hate mail that I've been getting as I've been branching off into writing about more general and, and broad legal topics um, mm -hmm. beyond just LGBTQ stuff and it's people just disagreeing with me but telling me that I'm factually incorrect and I have to say, this might sound really petty, but those piss me off the most. When people email me and they're like, not just do I disagree with your with your argument, but because I disagree with you, you're wrong. Like you are factually mm -hmm. wrong. And they will email our corrections department and tell them like, Mark Joseph Stern got this fact wrong. And I find uh -huh. that so 
I'm, am I allowed to curse on blogging heads? I'm not oh, sure. Oh, yeah, go I go find for it, it so <laughs> fucking irritating because <laughs> they just don't understand. Maybe they do understand. They're just trying to wrangle me. And if that's the case, I shouldn't admit that they've gotten to me. <laughs> and now I'm going to get this way more. I should never have conceded this in public. <laughs> I really regret it instantly. But they just, that's, that's a really smart way to get to a writer because, you know, I'm a writer. I... I want to be correct. I take pride in being factually correct. Like being accurate in my reportage is something that I really deeply care about. You know, pissing mm -hmm. off random strangers, not something I really care about. It doesn't matter <laughs> to me. But when people are claiming that I've done my job wrong, that really, yeah. that really pisses me off. And mm -hmm. so I, I have to say, those are the kinds of comments, much more so than like an email I got uh, recently that said, um, what a great country for you with liberty and butt fucking for all. Um, you know, that kind of email, whatever, that's silly. You know, yeah. take a screenshot of it, laugh at it. But when, when somebody emails my editor saying, you know, Mark Joseph Stern misreported this Supreme Court case and I didn't, they just disagree with me. That mm -hmm. really, that gets me. It gets to me. And I got to find yeah. a way to overcome it. Maybe you can help me because it's going to be a problem. <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, you know, there's that famous quotation, I don't know who it's from, you know, you're entitled to your opinion, but not your facts, yes. you know, not your own facts. Um, yeah, so, so I mean, so do you ever do you ever respond to anything, either the people who, you know, are screaming expletives or the people who lay out a more reasoned case? Do you ever engage with, with these people? <laughs> yes, this is going to make me sound like a terrible person. I never, I never <laughs> respond to hate mail. But, and again, because I'm so, I'm just, I take this bait so frequently with regard to facts, I got in this really long email argument about about whether race judicata would apply uh, in the Chris Kyle Harper Collins case that Jesse Ventura just bought, just brought with this lawyer right. in some, I don't know where he lived like Minneapolis or something but he emailed me and he was like you're wrong race judicata would not apply and I emailed him back <laughs> and I said but Harper Collins and Chris Kyle were in contractual privity when Ventura won his first suit against uh, against Chris Kyle and so race judicata should apply and Harper Collins should be uh, stopped from re-arguing the defamation claim and he wrote back and he was like no you're wrong you are so <laughs> wrong about this and like you know cite all these cases and i wrote back and it ended up taking up like half of my day arguing <laughs> with this guy for no right. reason for no reason i should not have mm -hmm. done that but i totally respond to those people and i take their bait and i can't resist it so yeah. help me stop please yeah i don't know i mean i don't know what the best way to do it is honestly um i mean so the difference between emails that people send you and comments that are posted obviously uh, if an email is something only you and the person who send it sends it uh, sees, and the comment is, is everyone can everyone can see it and everyone can join in, and and you know the comment flame flame wars are more often <laughs> happening in comments. I mean, so getting the facts wrong, that's you know uh, <laughs> that I yeah I can see why that is is more annoying because. Um, it seems, you know, you can dismiss a bigot or an idiot, but if someone is like, well, actually in 1942 and blah, blah, blah versus blah, and you're like, well, that's not true, you know, that's that's more frustrating. So, like, I recently recorded a uh, conversation with a friend of mine who's a uh, female poet, and we talked about poetry for about half an hour. And, you know, there's uh, it, it, maybe it's a little different on Slate because you have so many more commenters, but, you know, the first comment can often either set a good tone or set a bad tone <laughs> yes, for kind of the thread. So I, I won't I won't mention the commenter by name, but the commenter said I, I really um, didn't like that you didn't mention more female poets. And I was like, well, I was having a conversation with a female poet, and like we did mention female poets, uh, you know. So I don't know what you do with that. And I guess the, I mean I don't I don't so yeah I, I you know I think not responding to these things is generally healthy. Um, uh, it's a little different I think on blogging heads because our commenters see that we are actual people who have actual faces and they hear our voices um, so maybe they're less likely to say you know you goddamn asshole <laughs> because they, they can see us because that's not it, it's a little closer to face to face reality yeah. and you know the internet makes it so that it seems like you're just sending these things out and no real humans you know the words are just appearing on your screen and there's not actual real, you know, humans you know sitting at their own computers typing it right so I think you know, it, it, face to face uh, uh, always helps. That helps us a little bit here at, here at Blogging Heads. But you know, I guess I would just say, you know, any you know, we're talking to commenters. We're probably talking to a lot more people uh, who are commenters than are, are journalists. You know, just remember that, like, when you send an angry 
uh, comment or an angry email, you know, it's a real person on the other side and uh, they, they may read it and, uh, you know, they're as real person as, as you are. I think that's that's a valuable lesson. That's very uh, important. For, that's for very important any online remember. interaction. Yeah. And you're totally oh, okay. right about the first comment, by the way, just a side note. I mean, I found that so many times and that's one of the few times that I, I will wade into my own comments to correct the record um, because mm -hmm. people will accuse me of getting stuff wrong in the comments and whatever, you know, the marketplace of ideas, usually I'll have a defender. But sometimes, especially Especially when the first comment or the first few really pile on, it just becomes this firestorm of people saying that I'm an imbecile. And th that's <laughs> that's one of the few times I will actually go in and I will basically write a second article defending my first one in the comments and just okay, yeah. lay out my, my own rebuttal. Yeah, so if you're first, if you're the first commenter, it's kind of a heavy burden. And I remember, you know, there used to be this thing that happened on the internet uh, that doesn't really happen anymore, but maybe some places it does, is that uh, the first comment would be someone saying first. Do you remember this? Yes, I remember it. Yeah, absolutely. I kind of miss those, I kind of miss those days. <laughs> you know, it was a more innocent time. Yeah, but didn't that just It was just someone who on wanted to second. say first. <laughs> Didn't that just push yeah, the, so, the second commenter to well, the Well, that's true, but then story? sometimes you get funny things like, so someone would say first and the second person would say second, but then sometimes three people would say first at the same time. So one person, so two people are wrong that they're you know they're not first. Yeah. I don't know. It was it was a more playful, a more playful time. I I feel like in the evolution of the internet. Okay, so we we're about at the end of our time, but I, I as I said uh, in a previous discussion, I'm blatantly stealing a um a segment from Slate Culture Gab Fest and having you know cult, uh, endorsements. So uh, you know. Any, anything that uh, in, in the general cultural space or any any article recently that you've uh, that you've consumed that you would like to recommend to our viewers? Yes, it's a TV show that my colleague Brian Lauder recently recommended. It's on Amazon Prime. Uh, it's called Mozart in the Jungle, um, and it's about uh, a classical orchestra in New York. It's filmed in New York, which which is very rare, um, and mm -hmm. it's just beautifully done. It's funny. It's sweet. It's edifying. It's charming. It's well written. You've got to go watch it. I watched the first half of this season all in a row it's really amazing so go watch it mozart in the jungle okay great yeah i actually just signed up for amazon prime uh, a couple days ago when they had a when they had a uh, sale on it perfect so that i'll definitely check that out okay so my recommendation um i'm gonna go back to friends and um you know the i'm gonna recommend the uh the first season finale of the first season of friends um it's the one where uh, uh ross's wife uh, ex-wife susan uh gives birth or actually is her is susan the the lover? I can't remember. I can't remember. Uh, Ross's ex-wife gives birth and all sorts of wacky things happen in the hospital. And uh, it's it's a legitimately very funny episode. And if you have Netflix and you're thinking whether you should wade back into Friends, you know, check out this you know final episode of the first season. Uh, it made me laugh out loud about 10 times. And when I finished watching, I was like, wow, that was a really funny, you know, 22 minutes of, te of television. Um, and maybe it'll get you back into Friends, which I think holds up, you know, fairly, fairly well 20 years later. Um, so, uh, Mark, uh, thanks so much uh, for, for coming on Culturally Determined. And, uh, you know, people can check out your stuff uh, at Slate and uh, on Twitter. And we'll link to your, uh, your Slate page and your Twitter page. Um, so, uh, yeah, thanks again for coming on. Thanks so much for having me back. Okay, great. See you later. All right, bye. Bye.